Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to church on this April 19th. And uh, we trust that you are doing well in spite of all that's going on. And uh, we, we want to uh, just encourage you in the things of the Lord today on this April 19th and that you would be blessed. Uh, let me just uh, read a few verses of scripture from Psalm 138 first. It says, I will praise you with my whole heart because the, God, the gods I will sing praises to you. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. You have magnified your word above all your name. And in the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We want to worship you. We want to praise you. We want to sing to you and thank you for all your blessings that you give to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. we get changed because of the, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for that love today. Amen. Aren't you glad that you're loved? God loves you so very much. He told you that in John chapter 3 verse 16. God so loved the world. So he tells us that. Amen.
everlasting God. You are the everlasting God. You do not faint. You won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. What a wonderful God. What a great God that you and I have. And, uh, wonderful Lord.
hallelujah. You know, I could just hear the shouts of all the people in the church and just singing out how great thou art. Isn't it so wonderful to be able to have that in our ears and in our memory and that we remember all that we did in church together? Oh, I, I miss those days and I know that you do as well, but uh, it's coming. It'll happen very soon and, and I, I pray it happens very soon. So I, I'm just believing for a miracle that this uh, coronavirus would be gone and that we would uh, just uh, get closer and closer to Jesus. Amen. So I want to encourage you today and uh, to stay connected with each other. Just uh, keep phoning, keep calling, uh, uh, texting messages, emails, send anything out that will just encourage one another. And, and uh, we need the encouragement these days. I don't know about you, but I, as I sit at home and uh, uh, walk the dog and, and Betty and I sit and have meals together, have fellowship with each other, I miss the gathering of the saints. I, I miss those times that we get together, the, the Bible studies, the prayer meetings, the, uh, all the things that we do together. And, and uh, I really believe that uh, it, it's coming back and, and uh, oh, what a day that's going to be when we all gather again in church. And uh, it's almost like a taste of heaven, isn't it? You, you want so drastically to get to church, but one of these days we want so drastically to get to heaven. And what a day that will be when our Jesus we shall see. Hallelujah. Well, I, I want to take us uh, back to the uh, Garden of Eden this morning. And you, you may want to turn in your Bibles to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. That's where we're going to be this morning. So I want to encourage you. But before I begin there, I just want to tell you a, a, a cute little story, maybe a little bit humorous. Uh, but it, it's interesting. It, it goes that uh, there was this uh, Texas rancher. He was quite wealthy. And uh, anyway, he threw a big party. And uh, all the people were gathered. There was several people from the, the community. All ages were there. A and uh, young people were there. And uh, all kinds of people were there. And so anyway, this uh, rich Texas rancher threw this big party. And everybody was in the house. Just crowded the house right out. But then the, uh, the owner of the house, this Texas rancher, said, let's all go out by the swimming pool. And so they all went out the back doors and uh, somebody shouted out, look, look, what's, what's that in the pool? And they looked in the swimming pool and there was alligators and piranha fish and uh, uh, snakes, poisonous snakes. They were all out there. And so this Texas rancher stood up and said to the whole crowd, look it, I'm looking for a husband for my daughter, my beautiful daughter. and." Uh, uh, I've got half of my estate, half of my wealth I will give to uh, somebody who will jump into the pool and swim from one end to the other through all those alligators and the piranha fish and the, uh, the snakes, the poisonous snakes and all that. And, and no sooner had he said that, and all of a sudden we hear a splash at the end of the pool and, and you see these arms go wailing around really quickly and going from one end of the pool so quickly and uh, all the uh, alligators and everything started going after him, but he got up to the other end of the pool, got out of the pool and stood up there and this Texas rancher stood there and said, son, I, I didn't believe anybody would do it. I, I just want to congratulate you. You've won my hand of my daughter's uh, mar in marriage and you've won uh, half of my wealth. I, I just want to let you know what's going on. And the young man looked at the Texas rancher and said, look at all I want to know is who pushed me in. And uh, that's kind of like it is in our, our life at times, isn't it? That uh, here we are going through life and it's almost like who pushed me into all of this and who got me going through all of this? Well, life is uh, like that. The good and the bad, it's our life and we have to live the life as, as best we can. Uh, the Bible tells us even though we have this earthly mother and father, it was God who called us into existence. Let's pray before we begin, begin with the word of God. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we are joined together through the media, uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit would talk to us right now, that your Holy Spirit would begin to burn something new in us, that your Holy Spirit would begin to churn something deep within our spirit, that we would be able to witness that we've been with the Lord in this time together. So I pray over your word right now that as it comes forth, Lord God, we know that it already has an anointing, but God, as we speak your word and declare your word today, that people would come to know you as their Lord and Savior, 
that uh, those who already know you would get deeper in you and that we would feel that even though it's through the media that we've had fellowship with each other. And so we thank you, Lord God, for what you're going to do in these next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we are in this world. Who pushed me in? Well, God brought us into this very place in existence. It's the hand of God. And uh, Psalm 31, 39 says, God, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet un unformed. And in your book there were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me. O oh God, how great is the sum of them. You know, in life, we call each other by name. When we walk into church, we say, hi, how are you? And we call each other by name. Well, in God, we are not identified by our name, our family name, where we live or what language we talk or, or anything significant that we may have uh, achieved in this life. We are identified by God in a much higher way. We were made by the hand of God. We were created by him. He fashioned us. He made us in his image. And the direction of life that we want to follow can either be our own choosing or we can follow after what God has in store for us and his purposes and plans for our life. We can acknowledge God as our creator and make a relationship with him uh, and ultimately fulfill his purposes and plans in our life. That is the more preferred, I would say, that we need in our life. See, God's intention was to make this world and to, for each and every one of us to enjoy the world that God has made. God intends for us to spend our short duration in this life, however long that may be. And, uh, you know, we consider, you know, a, an old person of 70, 80, 90 years old. Well, to God, that's just a drop in a bucket. That's a, a minute part. But we spend our short duration here on this planet that, we, that God has made to have a relationship with God. That's God's plans and purposes in the lifespan that you and I have is to have a relationship with God and to enjoy that fellowship with him. And, and the questions for each of us today is, do we have that? Do we have that relationship with God? You see, when my, God made this planet and all that is in it, you can find all the great documentation of how he did it in, in this wonderful book called the Bible. You know, each and every one of us need to have a Bible and go through that Bible and find out that God has some great things uh, written down for you and I to find in this life and, and thank God for his plans and purposes. It, the Bible informs us of, of what he made, how he made it, when he made it, why he made it, and, and uh, why he made you and us. So thank God, because here back in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, God takes us right back there and tells us of the beginnings of this world. You know, I will not go through all the days of creation, uh, but we know and, and, and have before us all the things that he made, such as the sun, the moon, the stars, the ground, the waters, the, the oxygen we breathe, the gravity that keeps us in place on planet Earth, and, and the fish, the birds, animals, vegetation, everything is documented right here in the Word of God when he made it on those specific days. And so you can read about all that. But as you go through the beginning of this world, you see, the crowning part of it all was when God made human beings. Thank God for all the vegetation. Thank God for the animals. You know, uh, we, we, we love our dog at home, uh, Betty and I, and we, we love him. He's a great uh, friend for us. And, and, uh, but, but we know that uh, of all the things that were, were made in this world for our enjoyment, when God made humans, that was for his enjoyment to really uh, be in that place of fellowship. You see, God waited till after all the world was put into place, sun, moon, and stars, vegetation, fish, animals, water, land, all those things that he made. He, he put those all in place, but after all the world was put in place, at the end of it all, he made mankind. Mankind was the crowning part of all of creation. You see, he didn't make man first in the, the barrenness of the world. He made the world first so that you and I could enjoy the world. Man was created in God's image, so as the Bible says, and he made man and woman. 
and he told them to multiply and have children and, and to uh, go into this world and, and uh, just populate the world. It was what God wanted for them. And, and you can read that uh, in the Bible about how God wanted to have those very things. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Isn't that wonderful? I, I love when I officiate at a wedding and, and you say that, I now pronounce you husband and wife. When you have that man and woman stand before you and you realize that the man has left his father and mother and he's joined to his wife and the two of them become one flesh. It's so wonderful. And the result of that first wedding of man and woman, Adam and Eve, procreation was now on the horizon of this world and the world was before them. They could procreate, they could enjoy the world, they could enjoy the animals and the vegetation and God said that it was all good. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, that God said it was very, very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Did you know that God sees good in planet Earth? Maybe we don't at times, but he does because he's a, a good, good father. Uh, and, and as a parent, shouldn't we look for good in things? You know, God looked down upon us and he saw good and it was very good. But as a parent or as a grandparent, shouldn't we look at our children and see good in them? I mean, there's, there's all the negativity in this world right now, but, but shouldn't we see our children and our grandchildren and be, be building them up and, and see that we see good in them and, and that we see a future for them, that God has got plans and purposes for them and, and, and to urge them on into the things of God and, and allow them to see God's plans for their life? I mean, we, we see children today, and, and I, I look at our grandchildren, the things that they're in, gymnastics and, and music and, and all that, and, and we want to see our, our children talented in music and gymnastics and mathematics and technology and, and to be an author of, of writing books, maybe a painter, a, a leader, a pastor, a missionary, uh, anything that God has in store for them. But do we see those things, those good things? Or, or do we see bad? Do we see the negativity? You see, God put his creation at the start in the garden called Eden. It was beautiful. Man, woman, vegetation, the animals, all was wonderful. God said it was good. God sees good. His eyes are taken up with us. His desires are towards us. And relationship with us is wonderful. Time together, spent together, praying together, and, and walking together, talking together. That's what God desired with the first couple, Adam and Eve. And they had it for, for some time. And thinking of this Garden of Eden, it was so wonderful. It reminds me of a few weeks ago when we had church. You know, when we recall four or five weeks ago when we were coming together and singing songs and, and just wonderfully worshiping God, wasn't that a wonderful time? You know, we were all together in, in the, the building we have here, but we are the church. We are the actual church. We have a church building, but we're the church. Uh, whether we drove to church or walked to church, there's this, this idea in the church, our hearts that we're coming to church. We're going to worship together. We're going to be gathering together. There, there was, I, I just remember a few weeks ago, you know, and, and the singing uh, and the worshiping and, and the fellowship together and, and the laughing and the crying and, and the heartaches and the pain and the joy and the things that we go through together, the, the hugging, the handshakes, the greetings, just being together, there's nothing like it. It's beautiful when we come to church and we get, I, I can hardly wait to get back together again. And, and you know, we shouldn't take church for granted. Uh, we have wonderful times of fellowship. I can hardly wait till we get back together and just sing and worship and rejoice together around God's word. And, and, and uh, for me, church was kind of like a type of Eden. You know, Adam and Eve were, were taken from from Eden because of sin in their lives, but here we are taken from our church because of coronavirus out in the neighborhood, in our, our world, it's all around us. We've been taken from our, our type of a, a, an Eden. Uh, we were walking with each other in, in special ways, just like Adam and Eve were walking with God in, in special ways. It says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That tells me of the glory of God that shines upon the church. When we have fellowship with God, the glory of God is shining upon us. 
It's not the building, but it's the people. God is shining upon us. It's where God comes in special ways that, that it, he inhabits the praises of his people. But that was four or five weeks ago. Do you remember it? Do you recall it? How wonderful it was? Then a virus came. The government stepped in. They closed down our gatherings together in order for us to be safe together from the virus. We were to, taken to our homes individually. We were to, told to stay in our homes, and, and that's the way it is right now. We were, in a, in a way, cast out of our type of Eden, thrust out into the, the world no longer to have church. We were warned to follow the rules. We were told to adhere to the guidelines. And the idea is all this, that it will make us safe. It will make it safer for us that we could eventually return to our Eden, so to speak. Uh, are you getting the picture? This is kind of like what Adam and Eve, they had such a wonderful thing, but to be taken from that and, and the memories that they would have had, the, the blessings. Do you remember, Eve, when we walked with a God in the cool of the day? You remember how he spoke to us? You remember how it was in those, those times? And I'm sure they would have reminisced. If you have any knowledge of the beginnings of the book of Genesis, we know what happened, that that first couple, they were, they were taunted by the devil, they were the serpent, to reverse the word of God, to, to not listen to the word of God, to not adhere to the word of God, to neglect what God had said, to, to look beyond what God had said and see something that, that God perhaps is, is keeping from them. That's how the devil comes in and steals things from us. He taunts us and he tells us, wouldn't you like to have something far better than what you have? Do you think that God is keeping you from something that would be far better for you in your life? Withholding something from you? Taunting and tempting them to ignore God's word? Well, that's what the serpent did. See, life in the Garden of Eden must have been a, a tremendous blessing. All of creation around them, God walking and talking with them, you know, I often wonder in the Garden of Eden whether there was mosquitoes or not. I kind of think that mosquitoes in the summertime are terrible. It must be a, something of the curse. But I, I look back in the Garden of Eden, and I wonder if they had mosquitoes. I wonder if they had ticks. We, we, we have to take our dog and give him medication to keep the ticks off him. And, of course, when humans get a, a tick upon them, it, it can cause all kinds of problems in our body. But back in the Garden of Eden, they wouldn't have had to worry about that. They had no mortgage to pay, no rent to pay, nothing of which we are in today. I think that that verse that says the peace of God that passes all understanding was a good verse for the Garden of Eden back in those days. They had the peace of God that passed all understanding. That's what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Then we know, and to make the story short, they, they ignored God's word. They listened to the serpent. They ate the fruit, and then God had no choice because now they had eaten the fruit and sin was in their lives, and sin cannot be where God is, that they were expelled from the Garden of Eden for their disobedience to God. And, and that was the beginning in a nutshell, basically. Let me say that also that while in the Garden, the Garden experience or that life did not produce any children. Let me say that again. That garden life, that garden of Eden for Adam and Eve did not produce any children. So the children would have to listen to their parents and only know what was living in the garden, what it was like to have that fellowship with God and the blessings of God. Living in the garden, you have fellowship. Living outside of the garden, you live apart from God. You are away from his blessings and ultimately we are, are told that they are now under the curse. As I said, the garden did not produce any children, but while under the curse, the first children were born. They were born in the world apart from that relationship with God. In other words, they were born in sin. Psalm 51 verse five says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Adam and Eve were the only ones who were not born in sin, if you could look at it in that light as we are, but they opened the door to sin. They opened the door through their disobedience and they sinned and sin entered into their very spirit, their body, their soul, their mannerism. 
See, all of us have this opportunity to sin in this world. Every one of us has this opportunity, yet we all have this opportunity to repent of our sin. It's up to us if we want to continue in our sin or if we want to repent of our sin and enjoy the fellowship with God. It's up to us what we want to do. I, I would pray that uh, anybody listening to me, if you have not repented of your sins, that you would repent of your sins and come to God. You see, this was God's plan from the Garden of Eden and all through the Bible. And to this day, God's plan for salvation still stands. Last weekend, we spoke about on Good Friday, the cross that Jesus died upon. Then we spoke about the resurrection power on Sunday, how he rose from the grave. What, why did Jesus do this? Jesus came to this world to save us from our sins. He didn't come just for something to do. He came to save us from our sins. And it's up to us to realize and see that God sent his only begotten son in this world that if you believe in him, you would be saved from your sins. Your sins would be washed away. Your sins would be taken from you and you would enjoy fellowship with God. You see, sin in the Garden of Eden, where it happened, brought a curse. It brought judgment for sin. And that was pronounced upon mankind from, from Adam and Eve, was pronounced upon them first, but it was pronounced upon them all the way down to you and I today in 2020. Sin is still the ongoing curse upon planet Earth. We live under a curse today. And the only way to be free of that curse is to accept this fact that Jesus, God's son, came to this world, died on a cross, and made a way for us to be free. Did I say free? To be free, free. Him whom the son sets free is free, and free indeed. And I tell you, with my life in Jesus, freedom feels pretty good. You should try it sometime if you don't have it yet. Let me explain how what Adam and Eve did, which brought the effect of this curse even to this day. And we can see all the evidences of this curse in our world even to this day. Once Adam and Eve ate of the fruit in the middle of the garden, of which they were not to eat of, here's what happened. There was three pronouncements of sin upon the serpent, the woman, and the man. So let me give you these three, three things. Out of the judgment came these three things. First, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, we read, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You see, the serpent, the devil, is against God. We realize that because he tricked Adam and Eve. He got them to look past the word of God. He tricked them. He is against God. And all that pertains to this evil one is that his purposes are to thwart the plans of God. The serpent, the devil, wants to thwart the plans of God. And be reminded today that the plans of God is this tremendous love that he has for us. That's the plans of God, is to love his creation. And the enemy tries to get between God and us and tries to stop that flow of love. How many in this world right now say, I don't believe in Jesus? And no, I don't, I don't want Jesus. You see, the devil is working on their life and he's put a shield, he's put uh, uh, blinders over their eyes. They, they cannot see Jesus at this time because God's plan is to love every part of his creation and he wants this tremendous love to be upon each and every one of us. He wants us to be free. The devil is out to destroy God. He's, he would love to destroy God's creation and he works on us through wickedness upon mankind. John chapter 10 verse 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Did you hear those three words? Steal, kill, and destroy. Imagine that, the mission of of the evil one, the serpent, the devil, is to steal, kill, destroy. Do we see that in our world right now? Are we seeing any evidences of the evil one at work? We see the wickedness of mankind in, in every continent in our world and all the things that mankind does. The Bible tells us about the heart of mankind. We, we know when somebody loves God and we know when somebody doesn't love God. 
See, God looked down upon this world. Even back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in all the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool is said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are, are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. You see, the evidences of the curse are all around us. The paying attention to evil is more common, it seems at times, than putting our attention to God. See, I, I look back on my short life and, and I realize that when I was a little boy, we used to say the Lord's Prayer in school. But that is no longer the case in our school systems. For some reason, our authorities, our government, thought that it would be best for us to take the Lord's Prayer out of our schools. The, the government tells it's, it's best to euthanize our aged. They are no longer regarded as, as needed in a society, so they, they feel that we, we should euthanize our aged. We abort our unborn. We, we kill the baby in the womb. Is there no heart for a child, for, no heart for a, an unborn baby that is forming in the womb that, that God said, you were made in my image, I formed you in your mother's womb? We abort the unborn. We in our country, we legalize drug use. We illegalize marijuana. And all the while, this world goes farther and farther and farther away from God. Can we see the evidences of the enemy who steals, kills, and destroys? Well, God pronounced a, a judgment upon the serpent. He says, you're going to crawl upon your belly for doing this. You know, you're going to do this because you have thwarted the plans of God. You've brought sin towards mankind. Well, there's a second pronouncement upon uh, mankind, and it, it goes like this. It was given to the woman in Genesis chapter 3, verse uh, 16. It says, to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. For the woman, sorrow is multiplied. In, in whatever area sorrow is produced in, in a woman's life, it was not there in the Garden of Eden, but it is evidence right now in the life of a woman because of the sin that was brought into this world. They shall have pain in conception, says the Word of God. They shall have pain in childbirth, in pain and pain. Uh, if you were to ever go into the uh, uh, birthing of a child and, and seeing a woman, there's quite a, a length of pain. Uh, my mother used to describe to me the pain that she had. Uh, she told me I was a breech baby, that I was coming out feet first. And she told the doctor what's going on. The doctor had to spin me around somehow in my mother's womb. But she said she never experienced such pain as when I was coming into the world. I'm sure glad that my mother loved me, even though I caused her so much pain. But women have that pain. It says that in the Bible. And this is prophecy number two in the Bible, that which is fulfilled and being fulfilled to this day. And we need to understand that, that having children is not a curse. Please get that across in your minds. Having children is not a curse, but the bringing forth of a child will bring forth pain. Having children in pain is an effect of the curse, and it would be multiplied in sorrow. In the garden, there were no children born. So there was nothing to compare it with. I guess if you could say that, Adam and Eve had no children in the Garden of Eden, so they could not compare it. But now that Eve knew, there was pain in bringing forth children to this world. And the last part of this curse to Eve or, or upon women, it says, it says that your desire shall be to your husband, or rather subject to your husband. Now, in the Garden, man and woman, I guess if we could put it this way, seem somewhat equal in, in all their abilities and working in the garden and toiling and, and, and w working with the animals. She was allowed a choice. He was allowed a choice. But the serpent manipulated that truth. And of course, man and woman were, were both able to make decisions. But there seems to now be this implication that through what she did, that now a lesson would be learned 
in all her future actions would come under this guidance of her husband, that she would be subject to her husband. Now, this is a controversial subject for man and woman to ever get into, and I don't want to go too deep in this subject, but later on in the Bible, in the New Testament, we're told that, that the woman is subject to her husband. If you were to go to Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, and also Christ is head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by his word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love your own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, Without Christ, in a couple right now, there may be constant bickering and, and heartaches and, and, and even uh, a, a terrible thing may happen where, where wife abuse and husband abuse and all kinds of things, put downs. But in Jesus Christ, that, you know, just coming back to the love of Christ coming into our hearts, uh, husbands to love your wives, wives to submit to their husbands. There's a relationship that, that comes back into play here. It, it's almost a taste of the Garden of Eden. It's almost a taste of what God wants for husbands and wives to enjoy. And so thank God for when we come to Jesus Christ, a husband and wife have a different relationship. When they're out in the world without Jesus Christ, anything could happen. But in Jesus Christ, husband and wife come together in this beautiful bond where God is the head of the husband, God is the head of the wife, and it's like a triangle. They, they come together in this beautiful symbolism that God wants them to have. So that's the, the wife and what she experienced in the, the judgment from God because of what she did of eating of that fruit. <clears throat> but thirdly, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, is this last place of, of the judgment. And God said in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 3, he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face, and you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, of these three prophecies, the serpent, the woman, and the man, it's only the serpent and the man who God said, because you have done this, because you have done this. It's only pronounced upon the serpent and the man. And it says in, in Genesis, both serpent and man were, were present when God made this rule that they were not to eat of the uh, tree in the center of the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, man heard that word. In the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. The devil heard that word that you eat of that tree, that day you shall surely die. Now, can you see that the serpent would love to do this? If he could destroy this beautiful creation of God, man and woman, he would go after that with all he's worth. Now, there's one thing here that the, the devil knew of. The woman did not hear that word. All she would hear is that the man would speak that to his wife, but she never heard it, perhaps, from God. We are not told so anyway in the Bible. But the woman became like a a third party participant, but it's not let her off the hook in all of this either. The man listened to his voice, his wife, rather than God's voice. How much of that is going on in our world right now that people are not listening to God's voice, they're listening to all other voices other than God's. And in our world right now, there's a lot of voices. I choose to listen to God. How about you? I want to hear his voice. I read the Bible. I, I, I study it. I, I love the voice of God, and I love what he says to us through his word. And the effect now is that, that everything that man does, because of what man did in the original sin, the ground is cursed and what it brings forth, every part of creation that God pronounced as good 
even though it is still good in that sense, it will be laborious to have anything come from it that would not have been in the case of the Garden of Eden. Everything in this world is cursed. You know, I, I think of that Garden of Eden. I, I go to the supermarket and I, I buy grapes and I get bananas. And I often think of what would the grapes have looked like in the Garden of Eden? What would the bananas have looked like in the Garden of Eden? What would all those vegetables and all the things that we eat now that we, we love, but I wonder what they would have looked like in the Garden of Eden? Because now all the ground is under a curse. I wonder. See, we are now living under the curse. Everything is tainted by this curse. We have spoken on the curse, but now we see the curse at work in our, our world. Let me not leave you there because there is hope. There is an answer. There is a doorway to get freedom from this curse. See, a week ago we spoke of Jesus dying on the cross, being laid in a tomb, but he rose from the grave triumphant. Imagine that. So what is our hope? What is our future? What is our help in this time? In Psalm 39, verse 7, it says, And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Rescue me from my rebellion. Do not let fools mock me, says the psalmist. And then we go to Psalm 71, verse 14. But I will hope continually and will praise you. Yet more and more, my mouth shall, sh shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I hope continually. That's what the psalmist said. And I thank God for that hope that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but every day I live, I'm glad I've got this hope. It's a blessed hope because of Jesus Christ rising from that grave. One day he's going to bring us all into that very same place. You know, one day he's going to just turn us to that very place of, uh, of looking to Jesus. Uh, I pray this morning that every one of the people who are listening to me right now, that you would turn your eyes upon Jesus, that you would look full in his wonderful face, and that you would find the things of this world would grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Could I pray with you today? Father in heaven, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that uh, everyone listening to me, they're listening to me. There's no coincidences out there. They're listening to me as I bring forth the word of God. Maybe somebody right now is wondering if God is real. Maybe they're wondering if there is hope in the light of all this COVID-19. They're wondering if there is a light at the end of this tunnel. They've got all kinds of questions, but God, in you, Jesus, all the questions are answered. You are our hope. So I pray right now, if somebody out there does not know you, I pray that right now they will turn to you. If that's your desire, would you say these words after me? If you would like to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just say these words after I say them. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I repent of my sin. I turn from those ways. Come into my heart. Make me a new creation. Keep me in your love. And give me this hope that you give. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, let somebody know that you've given your heart to Jesus. And let me pray for all those out there who do know Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray right now, solidify and strengthen those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them be uh, on, on that uh, rising up right now in the praise and the worship of you. Even through this message, may they have heard something, felt something. May they have uh, been discouraged this week. But God, I pray that right now through this message, they would be encouraged. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We would have our Eden back. We will once again join in church. And I pray that it will come soon, Lord God, that we can come back to singing and praising you together as a body of believers. Thank you, Lord God. Bless each and every one of the members of our church and other churches in the city of Cornwall and the surrounding areas as we all to get together, Lord, as we all praise you because you're our Lord and our Savior. We thank you. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Could we conclude with that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full Into His Wonderful Face.
turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Sing it one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. God bless you, church. Be in his love each and every day. God bless you.